there are a number of interesting things about the book of Jude. One is the fact that in Jude, it's just a one chapter book. Like 2 John and 3 John and Philemon, Jude stands along with those as being just a short 25 verse, one chapter book. Another interesting thing about the book of Jude that many individuals tend to point out is that he quotes from non-inspired books. He quotes from the apocryphal book of Enoch and the intertestamental book called the Assumption of Moses. Now, the New Testament writers and preachers often at the time used uninspired material to illustrate points they were making. So just because he quotes from non-inspired material doesn't mean that Jude believed those books to be inspired. We have Paul, the apostle, who quotes from pagan poets in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, and also Titus chapter 1, verse 12. So Jude quoting from non-inspired books would just be like me using and quoting from the letter of the unsent letter of Abraham Lincoln just a few moments ago, just to prove and illustrate a point. Another interesting thing about the book of Jude is that it is filled with lists. That's one thing that me as, personally for me as a Bible student, is that I love it when the inspired writers, speaking through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, give lists. Because those lists that they give contain so much beautiful treasures from the word itself and also just from the context of what is being said. For an example, a list would be mentioning of three or more items. An example, if you look at verse uh, 2 of Jude, he says, May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. There's a list. He says, To those who are called, beloved, and kept. There's a list right there. This book is filled with so much lists. Jude is a list-aholic, if I can put it that way. And for me, I love it because there's so much treasures within it. But also another thing that's interesting about the book of Jude is the similarity it has with 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, a lot of people tend to believe that, okay, well, since Jude is very similar to 2 Peter 2, he must have not been the writer. Huh, maybe I wonder if this is Peter's, you know, long-lost letter that he wrote... And they go on in the spiel, trying to sound all smart and understanding, but in reality, they're just talking, having meaningless talk. The bottom line is that Jude wrote Jude, period. And I can prove it to you in a couple of ways. Number one, when Peter wrote 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter wrote about the condemnation of false teachers as a prophecy that they, false teachers, would come. Jude, on the other hand, is writing as if the situation is already happening. And because of that, when you look at verse 18, Jude quotes 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. So yes, two separate letters with two separate writers. Peter wrote about the prophecy of the coming of the false teachers. Jude is writing about the issue at hand that it has happened and it has already entered the church. But now the most interesting thing about Jude is that what we have is not the book Jude originally intended to write. If you already have your Bibles open there at the book of Jude, read along with me at verse 3. He says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation... I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So what was it that Jude originally had intended to write? Our common salvation. But instead, he had second thoughts. Not necessarily second thoughts, but the reason of why he may have had second thoughts is because he found it necessary to write to them about contending for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. He changed his plans, and he wrote a letter that he did not intend to write because false teachers had secretly gained admission. Now again, I couldn't help but smile when Brother Hunter was giving his Bible class lesson on Romans 16, verse 
17 and 18 in regards to watching out. Watch out and mark those who try to cause divisions, who teach things contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Because his lesson really fits in with this morning's sermon. An emergency existed in the book of Jude, so therefore Jude had to change his original plans and write something different from what he had intended. And what is it that we this morning can learn from this short but beautiful book of Jude? It's this. We must contend for the never-changing faith. I could have easily just put contend for the faith, but the never-changing faith fits perfectly with the message that Jude is trying to get across to his readers. We must contend for the never-changing faith. Now, granted, if time is given to us, I would like to at least finish this lesson, but again, there's so much good stuff in here. I may be tempted to kind of go off track, maybe just a little bit, and so it may end up turning into a two-part lesson, but I'm going to do my best to try and be able to get this lesson in uh, as one. So please bear with me and be patient with me. But there are three areas that the book of Jude can really be broken down into. Number one, he begins his letter with the declaration to the saints. He gives a declaration to the saints. He begins by saying, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now in this first point, in his declaration to the saints, there's a few key areas I'd like for us to note that Jude starts off with his letter. He starts off by reminding us of who we are. He starts off by reminding us of who we are. Again, he gives that list. We are called, beloved, and kept. Jude says that we are first called. Now, through our active participation, hearing and responding in obedience to the gospel, we have become the called. This is a Greek word that is in connection with the word church. Church ecclesia means the called out ones. We are among the let, the chosen people of God. God's invitation of the gospel is extended to all, and those who accept his gospel invitation through the obedience of faith find themselves among the called out ones. We are then placed in the body of Christ, and we are the church, the called out ones. And it is a great blessing to be among those who are called, is it not? Knowing that God has chosen us, that we are his elect, we are his people, folks. These false teachers that have crept in, they're trying to take you away from God. God has chosen you. The false teachers never did. God chose you. And it's a blessing to be a part of his chosen people. Amen? Better hear an amen. Amen, church? <laughs> All right. We are called. And we are also beloved, he says. We are beloved in God the Father and kept for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he is making a reference to where we currently stand. We are currently standing in the state of being kept and loved by God. Now, what's interesting is that this word for kept is the word that means to guard over and keep custody of. To guard over and to keep custody of. That's what that word for kept means right there in the Greek. It is God's desire to keep custody of his children. If you will, look at verse 24. He says, Now to him who is able to keep you, the word for keep, same Greek word for kept, 
to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority for all time and now and forever. It's God's desire to keep custody of you, to guard over you, to protect you. You belong to him. And so when you belong to him, he's going to do whatever he can to guard you, to keep hold of you, to never lose you. These false teachers that had recently come into the churches had nothing to offer the Christians. The only way God can lose custody of his children is when they leave him for false teaching. False teaching offers nothing. And takes away so much. It takes away your calm. It takes away your love for God. And it takes away your custody from God. Remember who you are. And who you belong to. Also, remember what it is that you have. He says in verse 2, May mercy peace and love be multiplied to you. Now these were qualities desperately needed by the Christians whom Jude addressed. These are few things, uh, there are few things um, more distressing to Christians than having to deal with false teachers. It creates distress and turmoil among those who are committed to peace and mutual love for one another. It tears the church apart. I think Hunter hit the nail right on the head this morning. And also from our studies on Wednesday night through the book of James, concerned about uh, the teachers who think they are wise in understanding, but they are not. It causes divisions and disorder and chaos. It disrupts the peace, and it tears down the mutual love that we have for one another. Jude says that when it comes to a time where you need to contend for the faith, make sure that you have a lot of mercy, peace, and love. Because when you are contending for the faith, standing for the gospel, standing for the truth, and debunking false teachers, it takes a lot out of you. It can be distressing. It can be very, very exhausting. We will certainly need to multiply these qualities when contending for the faith. Because later, look at what Jude will say. Verse 19 through 23, he says, It is these, these false teachers, who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit... Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Yes, we need to remember what we have. Because when false teachers try to creep inside the church... We're going to need a lot of mercy, peace, and love. Because having to defend the faith can be very exhausting at times. Not only do we need to remember what we have, also in this declaration he gives to the saints, he tells them what it is that we have to do. Verse 3, and I've already stated it multiple times here in this lesson. He says, I found it necessary... To write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude was concerned about our common salvation, but he found it necessary to write about the faith. Now, the two, our common salvation and the faith, are connected. One defines the other. If the faith is abandoned, our salvation is lost. What can we know about the faith? What does he mean, contend for the faith? Well, 
given in the text here, verse 3, there are a couple things that we know about the faith. Number one, it is singular. Not many faiths, but one. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. It is also revealed or delivered. It was revealed and delivered to the saints. The saints, meaning us, Christians, the called out ones, the beloved, those who are kept in Christ Jesus and for Christ Jesus, we are known as the saints. We did not make this up, folks. We did not discover or figure it out. No. Rather, it is the body of Christian teachings and truths which had come through the apostles that are not to be compromised. The only way that Christians know what to believe, how to be saved, how to worship, and how to conduct their lives is that God has spoken and it was revealed to us through his son and his apostles. This is why Jude urges us later in verse 17 to remember the words of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many of us who have grown in the church have been taught their whole life concerning about the doctrine of salvation, concerning about the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the Godhead, the doctrine of the resurrection, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of heaven, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of judgment day. We've all, who have been raised in the church, have learned and been taught that. Now, if you're like me, though, I often wondered, okay, how do we know that those are topics and teachings of the faith? How is it that you know that? How is it that we know that? Well, here's three biblical principles on what it is, on how you can know if a teaching or topic is a matter of the faith. And again, I don't want to, this is where I'm talking about chasing that rabbit. I don't want to chase this rabbit too long, but this could be just a whole wonderful uh, Bible class that we can probably even discuss on a Wednesday night and so forth. I'm on about uh, biblical principles of interpretation and so forth. But anyways, here is how we can know and determine whether or not a teaching or topic is of the faith, a teaching and a topic that we cannot compromise. Number one, command. Number two, example. And number three, necessary inferences. And I'll give you a few examples. Number one, if a teaching or a topic is commanded in Scripture by Christ or by the apostles, then it is a teaching of the faith. Here's, here's what I mean. Acts 2.38 Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That is a command. And so what does that mean? That means repentance and baptism is a part of salvation. They are necessary for salvation. Because it's been commanded. And you don't have a say in it. I don't have a say in it. You can't change it. I can't change it. That's a command and that settles it. Number two, if there's an example of it. Well, Acts chapter 8, verse 38. We see an example of both Ethiopian eunuch and Philip going down into the water to be baptized. And to have their, have their sins washed away. So we see an example of baptism in a man's conversion to be saved. Another example would be Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when they gathered together to break bread, Paul prolonged his speech until midnight. What do we see there? We see an example. An example of three, that they met and assembled on the first day of the week. We see an example of them partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We see an example of Paul preaching on the first day of the week. So you see what I mean? Example. If there's an example, then it's a teaching and it's a matter of the faith that cannot be compromised. And number three, a necessary inference. What is a necessary inference? Well, I'll go ahead and have us to hold our place in Jude and to turn over in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22.
Verse 29 through 33. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. What is the necessary inference that we see here? Well, even though Christ did not directly state that there will be a resurrection, but through his implication that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive, infers that there will be a resurrection. It also infers that after, when we pass on, we are still alive and awake. So that debunks the false teaching of soul sleep. You ever heard of the false teaching of soul sleep? Some in the brotherhood believe that once we pass on, we're not awake in paradise. But we are just like in a sleep. And we're going to wake up until Jesus comes back to Judgment Day. Well, that's not so. Because right here, Jesus just said that God is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is their God, present tense. That infers they are still alive. So the false teaching of soul sleep, we can just go ahead and crumble that up and just toss that in the trash can. Am I right? Going back to Jude... Hopefully those, like I said, I don't want to go off and chase a rabbit, but hopefully those three biblical principles that, that I showed you from Scripture on how to determine whether a teaching or a topic is a matter of the faith that we cannot compromise is this. There needs to be a command or an example or a necessary inference. Sometimes you'll find a command with an example, and sometimes you'll find a teaching or topic in all three of those, the bottom line is that it needs to at least have either a command, example, or necessary inference. If it has neither one of those, then it's not a matter of the faith. The saints, going back to Jude, the church, has custody of the faith. And it is the church's job to proclaim it and to contend for it. Now, the word for contend refers to the Greek sporting events and contests at the time. There were three main popular ones back in that time of the first century. It was wrestling, boxing, and running. Those were the three that were the most popular sporting contests at the time. And the thing that these three all have in common is this one word, struggle. It involves a lot of agony and struggling when it comes to wrestling, boxing, and running. That's what the word means. Struggle, agonize, fight for the faith. Jude is not talking about being dogmatic, arrogant, and unreasonable. Instead, he is talking about being bold, taking a stand, confronting it, calling out the false teaching for what it is, and it's garbage, and correcting your hearers with the truth. <clears throat> Unpleasant as it is, exhausting as it is, and how much of a struggle it can be, there comes a time when we need to contend for the faith. Because if you don't, then it won't take long for the false teaching to spread in the church like gangrene. And if that happens, you've abandoned your first love, and your candles or your lampstand or candlestick has been removed from the church. I know a lot of brothers and sisters who contend for the Constitution of the United States, but not so much for the faith of the body of Christ. There's been many times where I've genuinely often wondered, why is that? Why is it that we are just so and so bold when it comes to defending our constitution in this nation. But not so much when it comes to confronting false teaching, calling out the garbage that it is, and 
contending for the faith? Why is it? Why is that? Now, I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody, but instead I'm actually trying to turn this somewhat of a guilt trip into an encouragement for everyone. The same kind of boldness that you have for defending your U.S. Constitution, have that same boldness for the faith. Apply it to standing up for the truth, calling out the false teaching for what it is, and correcting your hearers with the truth in love. That is the declaration that Jude gives to the saints. He wants them to remember who they are, who they belong to. Remember what you have. Mercy, peace, and love. Multiply it. And then remember what it is that you need to do. Contend for the faith. Because if you abandon the faith, you lose your common salvation. And then, number two, verse 4 through 19. Now, this is where he gives, he goes crazy with all of these lists and all of these descriptions uh, about the false teaching. We won't have time to look at every single one of them, but I will go ahead and kind of summarize it and point out some of the important details within it. But he begins in verse 7, verse 4 through 7, about their designation. He says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Notice first off that these were people who have crept in the church unnoticed. They deny the Master and the Lord of our, G of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that they have rejected his authority. Verse 8. Placing themselves on the throne and bringing in their own teaching instead. That is what it means to deny the Lord. It means that you're rejecting his authority and you're making yourself the authority. So you're the one who's wanting to declare and to be in charge of what goes on and what takes place in the church. That is what they do. They take Jesus off the throne and they place themselves on the throne instead. They also pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Now perhaps they were living and teaching that it was okay to keep on sinning in the flesh because we're under grace. Hmm. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 6 verse 1? Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Inhales. God forbid, he says. God forbid. There are some there in the first century who taught that, okay, well, since we have this natural human flesh urge to commit these acts, well, I mean, if we have those natural tendencies, then it should be okay to keep on doing that. And even since we have Jesus, I mean, we should be okay since, you know, we're under grace. No. Not how it works. That is not how it works. So you see, they pervert, they turn the grace of God into sensuality, something that is fleshly and worldly. And due to this, they are condemned and bound for destruction. Verse 5 through 7. He gives three examples and illustrations to prove that God will destroy the wicked. He says, unfaithful Israel, the rebellious angels, and the immoral of Sodom and Gomorrah and her surrounding cities. In his example of the rebellious angels, when you look at verse 6, he says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Notice the word, stay and kept. <coughs> Same Greek word used earlier back in verse 2. It means to guard over and to keep custody of. Those angels were once under the care and custody of God, but decided to leave their proper dwelling place, and in doing so, placed themselves under the custody of eternal punishment. Jude is saying this is an example regarding the false teachers. 
The only thing that false teaching does is that it places a person under the custody of eternal punishment. Therefore, don't you think that it is important for us to contend for the faith? I believe so. He then goes on in verse 8 through 19, giving a description of what these false teachers really were. He begins in verse 8 by saying that these false teachers would rely on their dreams. They would claim that they have new revelations from their dreams and from their visions, and they probably make a claim also saying that God uh, whispered in my ear or he told me in my dream that I should do this or I should do that. They also defiled the flesh. God whispered in my ear and told me that it was okay to lust after that woman. God told me in a dream saying that homosexuality is now acceptable. That they can have a role and a position inside the church. Or after you know, so much praying and so much time you know, with God and deep prayer, he revealed to me that it's okay for women and females to have a position of leadership within the church. By doing that, they reject authority. That is the Lord and Master Jesus Christ's authority. They reject his authority. And they blaspheme the glorious ones. Now some people tend to may think that the glorious ones may be in reference to the angels, but it would seem that the glorious ones may perhaps be a reference to the church authorities, which would be the apostles and the inspired writers. You can look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. And then you can connect that back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 21. But in summary of verse 9 through 16, these were ungodly people, Jude says. No wonder they were blemishes at your love feasts, at your potlucks, in other words. Verse 12. No wonder they are under the custody of utter darkness forever. Verse 13. We may be assured that if we follow such false teachers, we lose our salvation and share in the custody of their condemnation. That is why we must remember the words of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 17. Lastly, real quick, his third and final section in the letter that he did not intend to write or originally write. He then describes about the duties of the saints. He begins in verse 20 and 21 by saying that, first off, you need to look after yourself. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves, keep, remain in the custody of the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. What do we need to do to be assured of our salvation? Build yourself up. Pray. Keep yourself in the custody of the love of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ and wait for the mercy of Him. Perhaps the main thing to remember here is that your salvation is up to you. Whether, or, whether you grow or not, whether you fall away or not, is up to you. No matter how dangerous false teachers are, they cannot condemn without your cooperation. Keep watch over yourself. Then he says, look after one another. He says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And have mercy on others with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. It may hear that Jude may be referencing to a three degrees of fallen away, or three levels of fallen away. He says, have mercy on those who doubt. This first group has not really fallen away, but they are leaning in that direction by listening to the false teachers. Therefore, they need convincing you need to sit down with that brother or sister, open up the word of God, and remind them who has all complete, absolute authority. And remind them who has the final word on matters of the faith. 
They need convincing. Second group, he says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. This would be a group that embraced the false doctrines, but probably has not been involved that long. So by going to them and seeking to bring them back to the Lord, we can snatch them out of the fire or save their souls from death, as the way James puts it. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Then he says, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. The third group may include those who have been involved with the false teaching for some time, long enough for the church to withdraw fellowship with them. Those who repent in this group, the church should have mercy on with fear, without excusing the prior conduct. <laughs> in other words, when they repent, welcome them back. Have mercy on them. Forgive them. Embrace them back into the fold <laughs> with fear. In other words, keeping an eye on them to make sure that it doesn't happen again. The most important thing to remember from this section right here is that we are responsible for one another. Lastly, he ends it by saying, depend on God. Depend on God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. After you have done everything you can and others have done all that they can to keep you from falling, you must still depend on God to enable you to remain faithful. Without him, we are not strong enough to endure. Without him, we would not be strong enough to contend for the faith. We must stand for the never-changing faith. As unpleasant as it is, folks, there comes a time when we need to call out false teaching for what it is, confront it, have boldness, correct the hearers, and throw away that false teaching. Our ultimate salvation depends on our remaining true to the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. When we hold to that one faith, we can expect to experience what Jude called our common salvation. What does common salvation mean? Well, it means as this. We're saved just the same way that they were saved in the first century. All right? If we want to enjoy the salvation they enjoyed, to have the same eternal reward that they received, we must be saved in the same way they were saved. And what does the commands, examples, and the necessary inference show as to what one must do in order to be saved? Well, there's the command to believe, John 8, 24. There's the command to repent, Luke 13, verse 3 and 5, Acts 2, 38, Acts 17, 30. Then there's the command to confess, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13, and 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Then there's the command to be baptized, to have our sins washed away, Acts 2.38. And then we see an example of that in Acts 8.38. We must then remain faithful, remain in the custody and the love of Jesus Christ forever. Until the unto death, I should say. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Maybe there's one here this morning who may need to respond to the invitation. As far as needing to repent and confess of a certain specific sin that they had just committed or that they've been struggling with. Well, the invitation is extended for you to respond to the gospel as well. If you have any need whatsoever, I encourage you, please come forward together as we stand and as we sing. Here soul, why will you linger? Wandering Friday.